So uh, Mark and I have got a quick under five minute intro. Most of the uh, talks today of substance come from Andy and Fernanda and Colleen and Grant and others. So let's just give a, a quick overview of the last exciting year of spatial omics. Um, oops, sorry, having a problem here. Here we go. Um, so if we look at the last year, there's been a, a timeline uh, that's been pretty rapid. We started about a year ago when at GenoFest, we had what we call the great spatial debate. And the idea of that debate, um, which was held as a kind of collaboration between the UMGC and the Imaging Center was to assess these technologies, 10X Genomics, Nanostring, Cartana, Biospider. Um, and we, we had this actual debate between the companies, which was kind of fun. And we asked them a number of questions um, along the line of this grid, you know, how, how does it work? What's the instrument? What's the readout? What does it cost? And so on. And uh, it, it kind of got everybody thinking about spatial genomics. It also made us realize that it was just these three technologies mostly that we wanted to think about. Um, then for the next two to three months, we had um, a number of meetings of what we called the Spatial Genomics Interest Group, which we've now changed to Spatial Omics Interest Group because uh, proteomics is also a tool. And, and a new company, ReadCore, kind of came into the mix, and we had a, a bunch of great um, virtual and live seminars with them. Um, during the, the winter, a couple of grants went in that we were part of, um, an AIRP grant that we mostly wrote, but with Laura as the PI to the university, asking for a pilot funding for projects on spatial omics. And then Laura put in a Minnesota partnership grant that uh, Mark and I helped a little bit with um, to buy the nanostring geomics instrument. Um, and then the dark ages hit, um, which are still kind of ongoing, but you know, for a few months, very little happened, of course, um, except that because Laura's grant was funded, congratulations, Laura, and thanks, uh, the AIRP grant for pilot projects was not, um, but thanks to Laura's grant, we got the nanostream, which is the subject of today's talk, um, delivered in June. And then there's been a period over the summer as we managed to get back into the lab where the team who we'll talk today got up and going on the nanostring training. Um, an exciting thing is that we were added to um, nanostring's premier access site um, uh, uh, among another um, eight or seven other select sites, which is exciting. And then in November, we um, carried out a really rapid project that you'll hear about today that Andy is the PI of um, called Fast and Furious. Um, the other main change that's happened over the last year is that there's been consolidation in the marketplace and now Cartana and ReadCore, both of whom have got kind of orthogonal technologies, have been acquired by 10x Genomics and Nanostring is still um, freestanding. So those are really the two companies that we have to work with going forward. And it's kind of nice that there's a little bit less chaos out there. Um, three things. I want to first of all thank Laura for uh, the huge amount of work she put in 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 both of those grants and pioneering the grant that got the nanostring geomics. It's extremely generous on the part of her and IBAM to do so. Uh, it also provided staffing for for a year for the UMGC and UIC to run the instrument for free. So second point, use it or lose it. That free labor ends in June. So now is the time to get on there. And lastly, in order to help uh, from the reagent perspective, uh, we suggested that some money that had been set aside for labor um, for UMGC instead be repurposed by the MCC to pay for the reagents for pilot grants. And Anya, Aaron, Doug, and others um, worked that out, and that is now going to be the case, and you'll hear about that today. Mark. So thank you, Kenny. And it's just exciting to be part of this uh, partnership between the faculty and the UMGC, the UIC, and and uh, the MCC and probably some other acronyms that I'm forgetting, but we did not forget proteins in this uh, approach. And during the same time, we actually through the UIC uh, paralyzed the acquisition of what's known as the multiplexed ion beam imaging system or MIBI. So the MIBI is an ion beam system that is going to allow us uh, to use mass spectroscopy to measure time of flight masses uh, on antibody labeled uh, formaldehyde fixed and cryo sections that's going to allow us to map well over 40 different probes simultaneously at a resolution that can be down into the neighborhood of 400 nanometers. 
So again, like the opportunity that is before you with uh, the, the nanostring project, there is a separate project, but in parallel, that will be an incentive for the use of this instrument as it comes online too. And I, I, I'm excited to hear about what we see here is that the images will, will be that of images, but instead of doing the half dozen fluorescent probes, we can now do 40 targeted uh, rare earth isotopes. We can map those at informatics places and spatially locate those back onto the tissue sections. So we're ready to rock and roll on that. Grant is also part of that operation. Um, we're going to focus on nanostring today, but look for upcoming presentations to the spatial interest group uh, in the future on MIBI. And thanks again for the partnership and the opportunity. Uh, so we have uh, Colleen, I believe, next, Colleen. correct? Yes. So thanks for that. Um, again, thanks so much, everyone, for having us here today. Um, it's just such an honor, and we're so excited to have you not only as one of our GPAS sites, but to have the Geomix as part of the University of Minnesota. You all have been so helpful and gracious, and we just so love working with you. So I'm just going to briefly go over the technology. I think that most of our time should be spent uh, hearing about the actual work that's been done here. So first off, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, just the overview here. Uh, so here's basically kind of a, a really busy slide talking about how the technology works. So first of all, I'd like to focus on the fact that we can do FFPE blocks, we can do tissue microarrays, fresh, fresh frozen tissue, core needle biopsies, whatever you can place on a standard traditional microscope slide. So here's just a picture of a slide. Here is the frosted side. Uh, here is the gasket that we place upon the slide to hold the fluids while we're collecting the freed up oligonucleotides. So this is basically your analysis area. It's about 14 millimeters by 36 millimeters uh, across. So you need to make sure your tissue fits within this area. So you, like I said, you're going to slice your tissue, place that onto your microscope slide, and then we're going to use two types of reagents to, vis first of all, visualize, and then second of all, measure what we can look at. So first of all, our imaging reagents, these are uh, labeled, fluorescently labeled antibodies or RNA scope probes. We do have four lasers in the instrument um, and we use these for only for visualization. We are not able to measure this laser light, but we use these to, um, to focus on the cells you're most interested in looking at and to enrich for those types of cells. In addition to those fluorescent imaging reagents, we have our profiling reagents. So this is what we actually measure. These are oligotagged reagents that are either antibodies uh, directed toward proteins or they're ish probes directed toward RNA transcripts. So, and this is what we quantify. We actually can measure these in a digital way of over 100 proteins and up to 18,000 RNA transcripts with the advent of our whole transcriptome atlas. Again, these are our standard IHC techniques um, and these even can be automated using a Likaban system. So we're gonna bathe that tissue that we've got on the slide with both of these types of reagents. It's gonna go through some incubations, washes, et cetera. And we're gonna end up with a slide that's ready to go on to the DSP. So just talking a little bit about the geomics workflow. Um, so we have these mixtures of these measurable reagents. So we either have these antibodies that are directed towards your protein of interest or this ish probe directed towards your target RNA that has a small piece of synthetic DNA barcode attached to it via a UV photocleavable linker. And it's this UV photocleavable linker that allows us to really find those cells of interest, to release these DNA barcodes and actually measure those. So we have mixtures of these that we put together. So many different proteins, many different transcripts that are bathed on your tissue at the same time. In addition to that, like we talked about in the earlier slide, we have these fluorescent antibodies. So these are either fluorescent antibodies or RNA scope probes that have a fluorescent dye on those that can be excited by the lasers within the instrument. So once we have that all done, we're going to put that slide onto the instrument and we're going to choose our regions of interest. So these can be as small as 10 microns, as large as 700 microns, you decide where they go and you decide how large they are. So then once we've decided on those cells, we can project this UV light from below 
And then we actually release these DNA oligobarcode tags into solution. So once they're in solution, then we have a, a, sip, a sipping device that actually comes over, sips up those freed oligos, and dispenses them into a well of a 96 well plate. So you can go ahead then and collect for each of your regions of interest that you've selected. Just keep repeating the sequence until you've actually gotten your, all of your oligos collected. Then we actually need to count how many times did we see each one of those oligos associated with each one of those collections. And that can be done one of two ways. It can be done using our end counter, which is a direct hybridization method, or it can be done using an Illumina sequencer. And again, just remember, we're only sequencing this little piece of DNA oligo barcode. Your tissue on your slide is remaining unharmed. It's going to remain there. We're not doing any sort of three prime capture or uh, cDNA synthesis on that uh, tissue. So just to kind of talk a little bit about these fluorescent morphology markers. Um, here are the fluorophores that we have lasers to excite on our instrument. Generally, what we will do is re retain one of the channels for DNA. Um, this is for a couple of different purposes. First of all, we use the DNA to actually focus the optics of the microscope within the instrument. And then also, we like to make sure that we're visualizing the nuclei using that DNA dye. Um, so one of those channels is retained for that. And then the other three channels you can use to uh, enrich for the cells you're most interested in profiling with those high plux measurable reagents. So perhaps PAN-CK is what you want to look at for a tumor. Perhaps T cells you'd like to look at. Perhaps there's macrophages. Again, um, we can use RNA scope probes for this. We can use primary fluorescent labeled antibodies. So whatever it is that you need to try to find your cells of interest for enrichment, these can be used as your morphology markers. We have five unique profiling modalities that uh, allow you to look very specifically at your cells of choice utilizing those morphology markers. So first of all, you can draw circles or squares or kind of freehand this polygon tool on your slide. Again, these are, you put these where you want to, um, you decide where these go, and then you decide what, how big they are from 10 microns up to 700 microns. And that's about the size of a 20X objective. And that's the objective within the instrument. So if in addition to looking at just a circle or square, you'd like to further profile and release only the oligos from a specific population of cells, we have one of two modalities that can help with that. So the segmentation, first of all, allows you to um, release only, in this instance, perhaps the tumor cells. You only want to release the oligos from your tumor cells. So the algorithms within the software of the instrument then will go through finding those cells that meet those criteria that are PAN-CK positive, releasing only those oligos associated with those cells. Um, you can actually then what we call flip the mask, which would be to invert this and then collect out of this region of interest, only collect those cells that um, were not those PAN-CK, so perhaps the tumor and microenvironment. So if your cells are touching one another, this algorithm is called segmentation. If your cells are located discreetly from one another, it's called rare cell type. One caveat here is that you need to make sure that this area that you've chosen to um, find these discreetly located cells contains enough of these cells to get a measurement that's accurate um, for the modalities that we're measuring for. Uh, we also have what's called contour profiling, and this allows you to draw a, a series of concentric donuts uh, from either, you know, and these can be any shape that you want. You decide how many of these there are. You decide how far apart they are. Uh, and then lastly, we have our gridded, which allows you to just place a grid. Again, this is user defined, how many of these, how big these are, and then go through and actually collect uh, out of each one of, of these particular grids. So just talking very briefly about content, um, our human, uh, we have content for both human and mouse for immuno-oncology as well as, as neuro. And how these work is that you start off with a core of about 20 antibodies. You add on these modules, which are about 10 antibodies each, up to six of these. And then you also have area for custom oligo-tagged antibodies that you do not see within these predefined modules. So these modules are 
set up to work together. We've done all of the validation studies for you. Um, so any, anywhere from the ordering screen all the way through protein-protein uh, interactions, and then making sure that they're working with the cells that um, we've delineated. And this can be done. Um, also, we have a small RNA panel that can be read out on our encounter, and this is an 84 gene panel. Uh, so all of these um, are available. These are read out on our encounter. Um, as we move through uh, the end of this month and into 2021, this protein content will be enabled on our um, on our uh, on an Illumina sequencer as well. So just a brief look at this uh, content. Uh, here is an, here's basically that 20 um, antibody panel that we looked at. Here are what these modules look like. I'm not gonna talk about all of these in depth. This can be found on our website or certainly working with Kenny uh, and his crew in the core. So again, we have this for human and mouse, for immuno-oncology and for neuroscience. We also have our transcriptome atlas. Uh, this is either our cancer transcriptome atlas, 1834 genes across 55 fully annotated pathways, this is read out using an Illumina sequencer. Uh, right now in our technology access program, we have both human and mouse whole transcriptome, uh, and this will be released for commercial launch in early 2021. Again, read out on an Illumina sequencer. And then just briefly, uh, the software allows you to, first of all, choose your regions of interest. Uh, those uh, oligo tags that are collected can then be sequenced. All of that data comes back up into the software where you can do your QC normalization and data analysis, mapping back all of this either protein or RNA transcriptional data back to the actual collections from the cells that they've been made from. And lastly, the GeoMix ecosystem allows us to work very easily with the core, even remotely. This is a roles and permissions based uh, software, so you can send your slides over to the core when they're stained and ready to choose regions of interest that can be done remotely. Those oligos collected, analyzed, and then uploaded back into the software where you can actually then access your data and look at that. And with that, we will move on to the next speaker. Thanks, Colleen. And we'll have Dr. Nelson go next. All right, sounds good. All right. Well, I want to uh, thank you again for the opportunity to talk. Hopefully I can get through this in about 20 minutes or so. Nick, you might wanna keep me on task because I have been known to talk more than I should sometimes. A lot of the folks on the, on the line know that. For those of you that don't know me, I noticed that we have a pretty good attendance today. Um, my name is Andy Nelson. I am a molecular and anatomic pathologist in the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology. And um, my research interests are in breast and gynecologic cancers. So we're gonna to talk to you today about Project Fast and Furious, as Kenny and I jokingly named this, which we truly did all of this work in 23 days just to show you that it works. And this is the first time that we've used this instrument. Now, granted, my group has a lot of pathology and molecular expertise, but we managed to get this done the first time with pretty good results, as I'll get to share with you today. First and foremost, though, before I dive in, I really wanna actually say my thank yous up front so that that doesn't get lost at the end of the talk. Uh, I really need to thank all of the people at the Bionet Research Histology Laboratory, at the UIC and the UMGC, who did a lot of hard work to make this happen. They did it very well. They did it without a lot of oversight for me, and it was tremendous to work with this team. Luckily, I get to work with a lot of the folks in this team day in and day out of my job. Also want to give a, a tremendous thank you to the Masonic Cancer Center. They provided pilot funds in order to do this project, so thank you to Anya and Aaron for approving that. And then again, thanks to Laura, Kenny, and Mark for making this happen and getting this instrument here. So I'd like to take a start with a question that I think some of you know the answer to, but again, I, I think it's worth spending a few minutes talking about it and sharing my perspective on this. So of course there is the Everest answer to why do we do spatial transcriptomics? Of course that's because it's there and it's fun and it's interesting and it's challenging. But I actually wanna borrow uh, one slide. Uh, many of you will recognize this from my colleague, Dr. Tim Starr, who was the flash talk champion from the 2019 MCC seminar series to kind of talk about how I approach 
this tool, what I think it can provide value to in, in my research programs and give you an insight to why we did what we did with this short project. So when Tim presented this, this one slide talk, he basically made the very compelling argument that historically when we looked at gene expression studies, we have taken a complex tissue with multiple different cell types represented by all of these jelly beans and we've ground it into a fine homogeneous pulp and we have tried to make assumptions based on the average signal out of that fine homogeneous pulp in comparison to other fine homogeneous pulps. And that loses a lot of nuance and a lot of interesting biology. And thus we came up with single cell sequencing, not Tim and I, of course, but the field. And really what that then allows us to is to use sophisticated algorithms and, and wet bench techniques to be able to sequence all of the red jelly beans, all of the blue jelly beans, all of the purple jelly beans, all of the green jelly beans, and keep them individually separate. And then again, use these algorithms to understand specifics about all of the red, all of the blue, all of the green. The problem that remains with single cell sequencing is of course, we don't know where all of these red jelly beans came from because as you can see in the jar, they are not all next to one another. And we don't know if this red jelly bean was next to this green jelly bean, or if it was next to this green jelly bean, we lose all of that context when we do single cell sequencing, because again, we are still completely dissociating the tissue. So to extend that analogy, I wanna enlist the help of my four-year-old. This is one of his floor puzzles. And I wanna use this analogy where this represents a piece of tissue in a tumor. And it represents the heterogeneity that we see as pathologists when we look through the microscope. So let's pretend that each one of these yellow trucks is an island of tumor cells. All of the land they're working on is the intimate tumor microenvironment with tumor-associated fibroblasts, tumor-associated macrophages. This is some of the other stroma that courses through the tumor, blood vessels, adipose tissue, perhaps these are inflammatory cells. And as I envision this, these are the tumor cells that are on the pushing edge of the, of the tumor looking out as they invade into the surrounding tissue, which is of course what I'm interested in stopping. Again, as Tim so nicely and eloquently laid out for us, this is traditional bulk gene expression analysis. We turn it into one big giant mess. We try and figure out what we can out of it by measuring averages. But here's how I envision single cell data right now, which is we take that, we dissociate single cells, we get a thin veneer of the transcriptome from each single cell. And then we use these sophisticated algorithms to try and say, well, this looks like a cluster in Surat or CC Finder as mostly tumor cells. This looks like mostly immune cells from the microenvironment. This looks mostly like tumor associated fibroblasts. Then of course, there's some cells that don't quite fit into all of those nice clusters. Maybe it has some characteristics in his transcriptome of a ship, which in this analogy is like an immune cell. Maybe it has some other stromal fibroblast features. We have some uncertainty in assigning cell identities within this. And most importantly, we still don't know which one of these tumor cells was around there pushing at that tumor edge, creating that invasive biology that I'm interested in studying in my lab. Now with spatial technologies, we can actually go in and take those little geometric regions of interest and we can ask that question, what is that bulldozer doing with those tumor associated macrophages and fibroblasts right at that leading edge of the tumor? What's different about that than the tumor that's more centralized? And so that's what we've done with our project. I have to very briefly tell you about RAM, which is the, one of the proteins that we study in our laboratory in collaboration with Jim McCarthy and Kaylee Schwartfeger. So RAM is a receptor for hyaluron-mediated motility. It is one of the HA receptors, and it is actually a non-integral membrane protein, which means it doesn't have a transmembrane domain. It likely gets to the external cell surface through cooperation with CD44 and other transmembrane proteins, where it binds HA and then leads to a whole host of things, which can lead to oncogenic properties. Now, others have published data that increased hyaluronic synthesis and fragmentation in the low molecular weight forms is increased in invasive cancer. They've also demonstrated that RAM is upregulated during tissue injury and inflammation. And others, as well as us, which I'm about to show you, have shown that RAM is increased in aggressive forms of cancers, including some breast cancers. So our proposal, our hypothesis is, is that RAM interacting with low molecular weight hyaluronic acid leads to an autocrine oncogenic signaling loop. So this is some of our preliminary data. So the data on the left is from a cohort of about 100 patients from the University of Minnesota. And this used that traditional bulk ground up uh, gene expression profiling using actually nanostring technology, just the end counter. And we identified in this cohort of breast cancer patients here at our university that RAM, which is also known as HMMR, is increased in expression in patients who are positive for lymph node metastasis compared to those who are negative. 
It's also more highly expressed in more aggressive forms of breast cancer, such as triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer. With our collaborator, Eva Turley, we developed a 28 gene signature that we believe reflects activation of RAM in the context of metastatic capabilities. And when we used unsupervised clustering of our, our patient data set, indeed it shows that most of those patients who are activated for this signature are triple negative or HER2 positive. They have higher tumor grade and they have higher propensity for lymph node metastasis. And it, again, it represents unsurprisingly the more aggressive molecular subtypes of breast cancer. We cross-validated this in a, a separate cohort with collaborators from the University of Nebraska Medical Center for about a cohort of about 485 patients. And again, it does a very similar thing. So this is application that same 28 gene signature. We find a cluster of activated patients. And most importantly, when we look at the survival, because their, their, their patient cohort has much longer survival than ours does, we see that patients with an activated RAM signature from bulk sequencing are at increased risk for decreased overall survival. So, so it's associated with decreased survival. Uh, one of my former research associates developed a model based on Friba Baybod's uh, mouse introductional inject injection model uh, of xenograft tumors where we demonstrate that when RAM is genetically knocked out of this cancer cell line, it leads to significantly decreased invasive progression from the introductal growth pattern to a, an extensive uh, invasive growth pattern through the mouse mammary gland. The other thing that we noted in that model is that when we see progression from introductal growth to uh, extensive uh, invasive growth, the number of RAM positive cells increases dramatically. But again, when you look at this, you see that the way that that mechanism occurs is through basically an on-off switch for RAM expression in individual tumor cells. So again, there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity. And what our lab is trying to study right now is this hypothesis that we have that there are distinct foci of RAM positive tumor cells, which create these micro anatomic niches of invasive potential within the tumor. And we also believe with our collaborators that we have methods to target this to therapeutically disrupt invasion. And so that's what our objectives are. And again, why we want to use spatial technologies, we want to help unravel that intratumoral heterogeneity. So this is Project Fast and Furious. So again, we got the green light from the Cancer Center in late October. We sat down on November 2nd to plan this with UMGC and UIC. Immediately, my team in anatomic pathology and, and in collaboration with the Research Histology Laboratory and Colleen Forrester went into action, reviewing slides, finding the right case, doing some preliminary immunostains that helped guide my selection of ROIs and preparing the tissue following nanostrings instructions basically by the end of that week. We took a big deep breath on Monday and then Grant started the slide preparation on Tuesday. I came over to UMGC, we sat down together, selected all 23 of our ROIs, and then the UMGC team took it over from there got all the sequencing performed through that weekend, and then handed it off to John Garvey, who did the data processing initially. That took the Monday and Tuesday, 16th and 17th. He did a little bit of, bit of data QC back and forth in Xanastring, handed that data off to us actually in the afternoon of the 18th. My team met with John on the 20th, and then basically we went through a process the last two weeks of exploring and understanding the data with an all-nighter pulled by one of my postdoctoral associates, Yu Yu He, who basically spent all night trying to look through the data and present what we're going to talk to you about for the next 10 slides. Quick legal disclaimer for everybody on that. So this is what we did. So this is a section of human triple negative breast cancer that is very aggressive. It survived neoadjuvant chemotherapy without even flinching. And when I performed immunohistochemistry for RAM, our favorite biomarker, I noted what I expected to note based on studies that we've done previously that RAM expression is heterogeneous throughout the tumor with significant enrichment in this peripheral area, as well as moderate enrichment in this different peripheral area, which as I'll show you has a tremendous amount of fibrosis and desmoplastic response different than this pushing border. So very distinct methods of how the tumor is invading into the surrounding stoma. We also compared that with CD68, a macrophage marker, because of course we work closely with Kaylee and so macrophages are also a very favorite uh, target of, of our studies. So let me show you in depth what this looked like. So when we looked up here at regions 19 and 20, we could see that about 80% or so of our tumor cells were positive for RAM. Now, when I look down here, what becomes ROIs 15 and 16, again, what you can see is it's a very different type of tumor growth. There's a lot of stromal desmoplasia. But again, there's a moderate expression, about 50% or so of tumor cells express RAM at a high level here. And then finally, I compared it to some of my uh, central tumor areas, most of which had low uh, RAM expression, 25% of cells, uh, tumor cells expressing RAM less, and you see that image right here. And just to give you a different flavor, this is what the CD68 macrophage distribution looks like. So again, 
the images that you're seeing up top from the nanostring instrument, green is pan CK, red is CD45. So it highlights how much inflammation is actually coursing through the stroma. Again, probably you could play with the gain to make that a little bit more clear. It's a little bit overblown in this image, but that's fine. But it does show you right here when you look at CD68 that truly this is a river of macrophages flowing through the tumor. And then when you look at these two different areas of the peripheral tumor border that's pushing out into the surrounding stroma, you can see that the macrophage density is different and the distribution is different. So that set up the ROIs that we picked. So just a quick note on some of the quality control and the retargets that we did. We sequenced to a higher depth and nanostring we recommended getting to about 5.8 million reads per ROI. And as you can see, as it goes through the informatic process, getting to align reads, you basically don't lose much signal. But when we do a deduplication, we lost quite a bit. And again, I'm not quite sure if that's typical or, or atypical, N of one for me. But we did reach our sequencing saturation targets based on what nanostring recommended, which is we wanted all of our eyes to be above 50% sequencing saturation. As I said, though, nanostring tends to recommend 2.1 million reads per ROI, given what the size that we were doing. Uh, and we essentially doubled to triple that to, uh, to make sure that we got there. Um, one note about no template control. So the reason why I have 23 ROIs is 24th was a, an NTC for normalization. Ours was a little bit higher than what was in considered originally standard spec, but again, this is an evolving metric for the platform. And finally, I chose those individual ROIs, again, based on my knowledge, as I showed you about what was going on in the tumor itself. So I went with the geometric pattern to, stu to study heterogeneity, as Colleen introduced. So I selected a static single ROI diameter throughout our studies because I didn't want to play with normalization based on the number of cells, the total area of tissue that was going into each ROI for our downstream gene expression studies. So we did do a nuclei count with that just to kind of get a sense of how well did we do. And you can see that we're pretty good. You know, we're between 300 and 50 and 625 cells per ROI. And that is the underlying biologic heterogeneity. So that area of tumor that I showed you, which was uh, demonstrating a lot of stromal fibrosis and, and had significant amounts of acellular uh, extracellular matrix, those had some of our lowest counts in comparison to um, 19 and 20 right here, as you can see, which were very cellular tumors. And those had some of our highest amounts. So again, everything seems to make sense for us. So the first thing that we did, and, and I'll try and keep track of what was done inside this, uh, the nanostring application and outside of it in R. This was done within the nanostring software, and it was just the dummy experiment. So we took all 1,800 genes on the CTA. I labeled uh, our different ROIs between normal tissue, and, and I should take a step back and, and, and uh, tell you that we did select three ROIs of normal terminal duct globular units in the breast tissue that was surrounding the tumor so that we had a, essentially an internal normal control to compare everything to. And as you can tell, when you look at everything that's in that CTA, of course, normal is very different in tumor, duh. But at the same time, what this does do is proof of principle that basically the experiment worked. We can tell very easily the differences between tumor and normal. Now, if you go down to a different level of nuance, I've labeled peripheral tumor ROIs and central tumor ROIs. And you can see even when we look at all 1800 genes, which cover a number of different pathways, we see that a lot of our peripheral areas are different and, and you know, cluster together and, and a lot of our central areas cluster together. And again, the nanostring software offers different types of tools to just basically get a 30,000 foot view at this, including a, a three level um, PCA plot or a three dimensional PCA plot and correlation plots. Again, showing that our three ROIs that came from normal tissue are very different than our three uh, ROIs that are coming from the tumor. Albeit it's all breast tissue. So everything's pretty red when you look at the whole picture. Now this was actually done outside of the nanostring software by you he in my lab using our packages. And this is where it starts to get interesting. So what we did is we actually took back our 28 gene signature RAM activation. We started looking at how that distributes the different ROIs that we looked at. And so what you can see in the first tumor bar, uh, the first color bar, excuse me, at the bottom of the unsupervised clustering um, output is that again, our peripheral and our centrals tend to look different. They tend to cluster together separate from uh, one another and of course separate from our normal tissue. Now I didn't go into too much detail but our 28 gene signature is both up and down regulated and essentially what I can tell you is is that the normal tissue demonstrates the pattern we would expect of down and up regulation and the peripheral areas that had very high RAM expression demonstrate the opposite again as we would expect. So in the areas where I see high RAM protein expression I am seeing the downstream gene 
transcriptional regulation consistent with RAM activation in those areas. And then again, we see some heterogeneity, and this is what we're going to continue to explore, is what is different between regions 20 and 19, where I had 80% of my tumor cells positive for uh, RAM protein versus um, 15, which again is, a, you know, clusters in the same neighborhood with 20, 19, 17, and 18, which again, all had very similar RAM phenotypes. Um, but what are some of those similarities and differences? And I'll tell you a little bit about in the next slide why 16 is hanging out over there. So again, there's other ways within the nanostring software that you can explore uh, expression activation of, of your gene set of interest within the CTA. Uh, overall, our RAM expression, our RAM signature expression is higher in the peripheral areas than the central areas and the normal areas on the slide that we looked at. And the range of expression is much different in the tumor compared to normal, which again is what we would expect since it is both a upregulation and downregulation signature. And again, what you can see with the PCAs is our normals tend to be very different from the tumor. And most importantly, my four ROIs for my RAM high invasive area are distinctly different. Now, the correlation plot actually told me something that I, I needed to realize too, which is number 10 appears to be an outlier, ROI 10. And so even though at past QC, when you start to get down to smaller and small gene signatures, you do have to pay attention to these types of things because you may get drop out in some of your probes for a gene signature that again is about, you know, 28 to, to 18 genes. And actually makes me remind you that one of the, the caveats with the CTA is that, of course, it, it's only 1,800 genes. Not all 28 genes of our signature were actually on it. Only 18 of our 28 genes were on our signature. So we're very excited to use the human pull transcriptome kit when it comes out. There are some elements of this that can also lead to new discovery, though. So again, you know, I went into this trying to look specifically at our RAM activation signature and understand the heterogeneity across the tumor in relationship to the protein immunohistochemical expression that I see. But we also then found that the scientists at Nanostring designed in a quote-unquote matrix and metastasis, metastasis signature of about 50 or so genes. So I just had the tool do unsupervised clustering with that. And then again, lo and behold, it does things that we would actually expect it to do. And so our normal tissue looks very different than our tumor. And our peripheral areas versus our central areas of the tumor are, again, very different. And so what we can then start to do now is do a little bit more exploration of what is within this gene signature versus the one that we developed and see if we can optimize our signature of RAM activated breast cancer invasion, uh, optimize that and, and increase its, its specificity. You also performed uh, a number of uh, differential gene expression experiments outside of the tool. Again, in R, you can download the data and put it into R packages and explore it that way. So she compared regions 19 and 20, which again are RAM high to, and peripheral, to regions 3 and 4, which were RAM low and central. Developed gene expression, uh, differential gene expression lists, uh, displayed that here as you can see on the right-hand side by volcano plots gave us lists of our, our statistically significantly uh, regulated genes, which include things that make sense at the peripheral area. Things that are enriched include cell cycle genes like cyclin B1, cyclin D1, some interesting things perhaps, uh, superoxide dismutase, and of course things that we would expect out there at the periphery like MMP9, matrix metalloprotease 9, as well as a number of immune related uh, genes which are differentially expressed across the tumor. She also then took a rank ordered list of the differentially expressed genes, all of them, all 1800, and then ran that through GSEA to identify processes that were most enriched in that area and brought up again some immune related signatures, type 2 interferon signaling, MHC class presentation. And again, these are using the gene lists that are pre defined into the 1800 gene list of the CTA, as well as some metabolism and cell cycle things. She did that same type of a comparison with our two other areas. So now we've got our highly fibrotic areas uh, that are peripheral and RAM moderate in their expression. So areas 15 and 16, comparing those to again, areas three and four. And this actually provides me an op another opportunity for a side note too. Part of the way that Grant and I, when we went through and dropped those ROIs, we made sure that we actually dropped ROIs in similar areas so that we would actually have essentially two representative ROIs from what I as a pathologist was thinking is an area, a region, of a specific subtype of intratumoral heterogeneity. And so again, the, the differential, uh, the significantly differentially expressed genes are somewhat different here. Uh, it's a much smaller list, but again, we see things like MMP7 that are upregulated in our peripheral areas, cyclin D1 again. 
But again, because you, when you do GSA, you can use the entire rank list. Uh, I, again, we see that they're actually similar properties. So again, we see type one, now type two interference signaling is also enriched at, at those areas. Uh, overall, and again, you know, I haven't explored how different these diff these three gene signatures are from one another, but this allows us to start to do a little bit more discovery work at, on top of essentially our hypothesis driven question about do we truly see transcriptional evidence of RAM activation in the areas where I see RAM protein. So in conclusion, the technology allows detailed comparison of anatomically distinct regions in the heterogeneous TME. Uh, what we did was compare with serial immunohistochemistry and h and &E's so that I could target those ROIs to drive both hypothesis-based and discovery-based questions. Really, my recommendation is you're thinking about this technology is you really need to know your strategy and you want to know the questions that you want to ask before you start your experiment because that's going to drive how you select your ROIs and how big your experiment's going to be, how deep you need to sequence, how many ROIs you need, etc. And it really does require multidisciplinary expertise. Like I said, I'm blessed to be able to work with many of the people across UIC, UMGC, the research histo lab all the time before this. But again, you really need a, a really good team. You need to develop relationships with all of the, the wonderful colleagues that are in those three places in order to make this work well. So with that, I'll just say thank you. Uh, in the instance of time, I, I'd rather turn it over, um, but obviously all the names up on the screen are the people that made this happen. Um, and appreciate the opportunity to share uh, what we were able to accomplish in just 23 days. Thanks, Dr. Nielsen. And now we'll hand it over to Dr. Rodriguez and Dr. Barthel. Sorry. So, Thank you very much for this opportunity, guys. Um, um, you know, after watching Andy's awesome presentation, I'm sure you all are asking yourselves uh, how you can get your own hands and on your own, how you can get your own genomics project started. And so let's first talk uh, about what we have today available uh, through our spatial workflow, uh, specifically to the genomics platform. And that would be the Cancer Transcriptome Atlas that Andy just presented on. The Encounter RNA assay, it's a smaller uh, 84 plaques immune pathway, as well as the, all the protein uh, panels. And hopefully coming soon, at the beginning of the year, we'll be able to uh, also offer the whole transcriptome atlas, both human uh, and urine that is coming up. Uh, so as you guys have seen so far uh, with everybody's talk, this is really, um, a workflow that uh, includes a lot of depart several departments. Uh, so I'd like to, the, to go over a little bit how, who you're gonna be interacting with in this workflow. Like Andy said, it's important for us to uh, get together and collaborate. And yes, you are part of this collaboration and uh, a collaborator in this. So the idea is that if you're gonna need help with tissue sectioning and mounting, you're gonna go work very closely with Colleen Foster. She runs the Bionet lab and has tons of experience. Sometimes there's going to be the need to have some pre-optimization before uh, you start a project. But once the project starts then, uh, and the slides are ready, um, Grant then from the Imaging Center is going to be processing those slides and staining. You're going to sit with Grant to look over the images scanned and he's going to help you uh, with the ROI selection using the, the software. Uh, next, then Emma from the Genomics Center will take over the workflow and get the samples ready for sequencing or counting through the end counter, depending on the panel uh, you selected. John Garvey will then process and QC the data. And here you are back again. Like Andy said, you, you joined us at the end. Uh, usually uh, it's going to be Grant and John, and they'll sit down with you, overview your results, and uh, we'll go, uh, I'll go a little bit more detail uh, later in the presentation, what you expect from this one. So how do you get started? Basically contact the spatial omics uh, UMN team. I know we had some glitch. I had some glitch with my client mail, uh, but that's fixed. So if you forget, you don't know um, where you wrote down that email, uh, just go to the UMGC or the imaging center pages. They'll take you to the information you need. The email is up there. Once you connect with us, we're gonna set up a consultation. Uh, you can play with some new calculator that Alex Kramer from the UIC, from the Imaging Center put together. So you can live uh, kind of play with the number of slides versus ROIs, because this can be kind of a tricky platform to understand those things and how it's gonna impact your cost. Um, 
We're going to talk about timelines and we can send you a quote with the cost. And if you decide to move on with the project, you're going to have to set up a couple of, uh, um, send out a couple of forms. Next, I'll let uh, Grant and get started on the technical workflow. Yeah, thanks, Fernanda. So in order to give you a more practical understanding of how the Geomex workflow is actually implemented here at the University of Minnesota, and maybe to help you think uh, as you start planning experiments, um, we're going to go through just a little brief description of, of the technical workflow. Uh, first, a high-level overview, followed by a little bit more detail for each step. So the first step uh, in the workflow is the sample preparation and sectioning, which if you don't want to do by yourself, uh, as has been mentioned, will be done by the histology lab and, and Colleen Forster. Uh, they're located at Jackson Hall. Uh, once the slide is actually prepared and the tissues are mounted, the workflow moves to the University Imaging Centers, where we do the manual uh, tissue pretreatment, uh, the actual staining of barcodes. Um, Following that, we do the morphology marker staining and the actual instrument run. Um, after the instrument run, when the oligos are cleaved, they enter a 96-well plate, and at that point, the specimens flow through the UMGC workflow. Uh, for the higher plex assays, they undergo library prep, and for the lower plex assays, they actually undergo the end counter readout, uh, followed by sequencing, again, for the higher plex RNA assays, um, and then the NGS workflow, data analysis, and QC step, and finally, the data is then handed off to the clients, and these days it's done during a Zoom meeting. Um, so we'll get a little bit more granular now and talk about each step in detail. Again, you can choose to mount these yourself. There's no special slide requirements for the Geomix platform, um, but if you do need help or want an expert to take care of this step, Colleen is there to help. Um, again, this does work with FFPE samples as well as fresh frozen samples. Um, sectioning and mounting is required. Uh, the RNA assays are sensitive and do require use within two weeks due to RNA degradation, so that's something to think of on planning experiments. The protein assays are not as sensitive and there's a little bit uh, more room to work there and a little bit less coordination. Once slides are sectioned, uh, we move into an optional step, which uh, is not trivial, as Dr. Nelson talked about uh, in his talk. It's important to, to really understand our, our ROI strategy uh, and optimize our morphology marker staining. An important distinction here, um, these markers are used for visualization and selection of our areas of interest, not the actual data readout. Um, so it's important to know ahead of time what we're selecting and why. So um, this can be an important step done in the UIC. We will scan your slide on the actual instrument with the morphology markers of interest. These can be nanostring reagents, or if you have custom markers that you're interested in, um, we can then fine tune our ROI selection uh, before we add the expensive barcoded probes. Um, and if you move to the next slide, please, Fernanda, you can see kind of an example of, of that ROI selection. Um, we really get an idea of, of the spatial distribution uh, of your cells of interest and can really fine tune our ROI selection. Once we are confident in our area of interest strategy, uh, we move to the actual staining with barcoded probes. This is done in the UIC. It's usually about a half a day process. We'll bake the slides, de-paraffinize them, do tissue pretreatment with an antigen retrieval and a protease digest, followed by the overnight staining step of the barcoded probes. The next step is a wash to remove unbound probes, followed by the morphology marker staining. And this again is a typically about a half a day process, uh, usually the next morning. From there, the slide is ready to go to the DSP instrument itself for the actual area of interest selection. Um, this is actually, you might recognize this tissue. This is a picture of the day of from Dr. Nelson's uh, AOI selection. Uh, as you can see there in the lower left, he did do a traditional IHG staining with his, his RAM protein of interest, and we were able to then uh, fine tune those areas of interest with the fluorescent morphology markers on the, on the system itself. And this can be done either in person, as was the case with this project, or we can do this remotely as well. Once the AOIs are selected, the DSP instrument does the collection of the oligo barcodes and deposits those into a 96 ball plate. And from there, they proceed on to the UMGC side of the workflow. Thank you, Grant. So depending on which panel you chose, your samples then will go through the NGS workflow, which is the next generation sequencing workflow. Uh, for counting through sequencing or through the end counter. 
Again, uh, it's good to remind everybody, like Colleen said, this is not, um, you're not gonna get sequencing data from uh, any gene, uh, mRNA or anything like that. You're getting a count, basically a count, a quantification of the probes. So focus, uh, the, the choice of your panel should be focused on, on, the, on the targets and not on the workflow. So here's what you expect from us when your data is ready. Our ultimately, uh, ultimately we want to deliver is uh, giving you access, we'll give you access to the genomic software where uh, your data is gonna be available and ready for analysis. Uh, it will include the scanned images and the probe count. Um, there is a basic informat informatics support included in the project and that will include uh, data QC and a Zoom meeting with John and Grant while well, they'll go over you know, the, the genomics instrument user interface, uh, the QC process. And they'll also, uh, also direct you to some helpful documentations and tutorials by, by NanoStream. And if you, like uh, Andy highlighted, you might want to do more uh, with your data, uh, there's a lot that can be done in addition. You can, uh, and you're not able to do yourself with your, with your team, uh, you can actually reach out to the MSI, Riz, uh, Christine Hensler, or if you're part of the lab of medicine and pathology, uh, you can coordinate with Sarah Munro. So I said her name correctly. So I want to give you guys an idea of the turnaround time and cost. As an example, I'm gonna use the most common choice uh, project, which is four slides for the cancer transcriptome atlas and 12 ROIs. Remember that one of them, like uh, Andy said, has to be a uh, uh, negative control. So it's really 11. So by now, you guys have it very clear how complex the workflow is and how it involves several departments. So we have to be really well aligned. But the idea here, even though it's called complex, um, is to actually once um, the pre-optimization part is, is completed, that this and samples are ready you know, to be sectioned and mounted, that, that should, you should get your data back in about two weeks. That's, of course, if everything goes smoothly, right? Right now, because labor is subsidized until June 2021, like Kenny said, uh, a project like this will cost around uh, $8,000. If you wait until after June or have a grant to write, uh, uh, it's about $12,000 uh, for the same project with labor included. We do request that the user give a presentation at this spatial interest group when you have the data analyzed. It's a way for uh, us to learn from you and for you guys to learn from each other. So it's a very helpful uh, venue. And so I'll take the opportunity to, after the long pause, we're bringing it back. So I want to announce that we're gonna have our next session in January 14th, 2021. So please keep your eyes uh, open for an official announcement coming out soon. And lastly, I want to go in a little bit more detail what Kenny mentioned in the intro, which is this uh, grant for the Masonic Cancer Center members. You have the opportunity to run for free one slide uh, through our um, spatial workflow, geomics workflow. Um, the potential panels will be the, all the panels we have available right now currently in the lab. And I say potential because, um, you know, the, those panels are sold in kits. And for example, the CTA is sold in four slides, uh, for four slides, and the other panels are, all, are sold for 12 slides. So we cannot just let everybody choose, and, and we're going to have to group and make the runs uh, in groups of four slides. So there's a lot of coordination that's going to need to happen. Basically, what uh, the idea is, uh, please contact us at the specialomics uh, at umn.edu email. We'll have individual meetings with each one of the interested parties, find out what are the, um, the panels on higher demand. And those are gonna be the ones that are gonna be funded through this initiative. And remember again, to start earlier uh, is better since we want to make sure um, you know, we maximize this funding uh, and complete as many projects as we can by, by June of this coming year. Again, thank you everybody and Here's the email if you haven't written it down yet. If you have any questions, please make sure to contact us. Thanks so much. Uh, we've had a number of questions already come through throughout the talk, which have been uh, answered with uh, the typed chat function. Um, but we do have a little bit of time left here. So for new questions, I'll just remind the folks that uh, you can ask questions two ways by either typing them into the Q&A module and we'll read them aloud, or you can use the raise hand feature and then we can give you permission on mute. Uh, so yeah, please uh, send us some more questions here and 
looks like we have some more coming in right now. So panelists, if you want to go ahead and read these questions off and answer them aloud at this point. So I see that actually Colleen is answering one of the questions. What depth do you need from a routine FFP block for these slides? And the slides can be reused. Um, also, can the NSK9 IO platform be used in the platform or non-human, non-mouse? Are we limited to Lumina Seek? So yes, we're limited, limited to, I can answer that part because that's part of the MGC. We're limited to the Lumina sequencing. That's our platform and that's, uh, that's what it runs on actually. Uh, I will, maybe Colleen can unmute herself and answer the other questions. The slides can, can be reused if you're using the same platform. I know that's if you're doing proteins, for example, you can, they can be rerun on different panels, but it has yeah. to be the same type of panel. Yep, absolutely. So just, you know, there's no magic associated with the panel. So, I mean, like anything, if you're going to do an antigen retrieval uh, for protein analysis, then, you know, you certainly can do additional protein targets. But if you're going to do an RNA retrieval off of your, uh, for your tissues, then uh, you're probably going to destroy many of your protein targets. So just take into account what you're actually retrieving and what you're doing to those slides. But overall, if you need to do an H and E on these afterwards, then you certainly can do that as well. Thank you, Colleen. So another question is, can slides come from elsewhere? And I imagine the question is related to if it has to be through the UMN uh, and uh, Colleen's uh, Forster lab. And, and the answer is yes. Uh, we just make sure it's always coordinated with us. We're gonna send you all the documentation, all the guidelines, so the lab, the lab whoever's handling this part knows exactly how to, to proceed. Yeah, Fernanda, and, and I want to make a comment on that as a pathologist. This really needs to be done by someone who is a trained histologist. You don't want like a grad student that learned how to cut licks last week doing this. This needs to be done by a fully trained professional or you will not get good results. You know, there are caveats about how to handle the cuts. You can't just go get archive slides that have been cut, even if they've been, honestly, if they've been stored well, even that's probably not a good idea. You need to use RNA-free technique in the cutting. The, the, there are, Nanostring has very specific recommendations about how to, to lay down the slides. It is, a, it is a, not a standard type of slide used routinely in labs. So, so yeah, I mean, it, you've got to be very thoughtful about how you do it. If your lab is essentially a histology lab, you'd be fine. But if, if you don't have essentially professional histologists that, that staff your laboratory, you're going to want to go through the research histo lab. And, and yes, you can get the block from elsewhere and have it cut here. And, and like Andy is saying, it's like, it's the beginning, is the main thing on this project to start well. If it starts uh, with yep. bad uh, tissue, you're, you're not gonna get good data and it's such an expensive project. And, uh, but I know what you meant, Jose. It's like, uh, it sounds like you're expecting to, uh, as an option to get blocks from somewhere else and yep. then get it cut here. Yeah, yep. that's possible. Um, are there options for bringing in other RNA panels uh, like metabolism, or are you recommending that we wait for whole transcriptomic atlas? Is there a cost difference between uh, versus implementation difference? Yeah, so currently for RNA, what we have available is that cancer transcriptome atlas that, that Andy spoke of, uh, and then we will be coming out with the whole transcriptome. There won't be any additional RNA panels, such as you're asking for um, metabolism, et cetera. Um, we figure that, you know, looking at the whole transcriptome for all of the protein coding genes should cover most of those questions. And is there a cost difference um, versus implementation difference? I guess that's not a question for me to answer. There's actually not a specific, uh, we don't have a cost yet on whole transcriptome for the reagents um, that hasn't been commercially launched that will launch in 2021. So uh, you know, hold hold tight, and we'll get you we'll get you some uh, pricing data coming up. You're going to need to sequence more deeply, though, right, Fernanda? Y yes, it increases the risk, but in the, co the cost is going to there's going to be an increased cost just because yes. it, you need more sequencing, and then that's one of the also another expense expensive part of this workflow. Um, if we need to obtain very special samples in in a form of slides, should we communicate with MCC in advance? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, what is the special? Um, do you know anything about that, Andy? You're the one that understands. No, that. I mean, outside of, again, you know, I, I see that Colleen's answering some other questions. I mean, Colleen is, 
if, if you want to talk to someone who knows how to cut anything and random stuff, like she is going to be your best friend. Yeah. <laughs> Period. The well, reinforcer is, is the person to talk to, yeah. find out. And, and you know, and even before, if you think it's going to be something very odd and you don't yeah. want to waste time, just go and uh, start uh, some trials with her. Some, you know, it's, it's the, you know, it's the first part to get right. So. One of the original, for Colleen Irving, um, one of the original questions up on the top, it, it, it talks about targeting rare and single, uh, rare cells. And the question is, can, can the profile of a single cell be acquired? I think I know the answer, but I want to defer to Nana Stream. Uh, we, we don't encourage single cell. And this is certainly not a single cell analysis platform. Um, we're looking, we're using those morphology markers to enrich for your cells of interest. That's why we use those. Um, again, this is just either a direct hybridization using our encounter or, you know, the, the library prep is basically just used to ligate the, the uh, Illumina adapters onto that little piece of barcode that we have. So we're not, you know, uh, amplifying per se. So um, it, I have seen uh, some instances where they're looking at neurons uh, in brain for protein and they have been able to profile at a single cell level. But again, that's a very large cell with a very high protein component on it um, and more of an exception versus the rule. I think it, uh, Colleen, it can be confusing for some people, and it was for us at first, when we see the rare cell as one of the profile methods. Sure, sure. And what it's doing is uh, you're, like Colleen said, you are, um, you can, if you, had, if you can have a marker that can identify, you can see those rare cells, mm -hmm. yeah. you, you can select them, but you're going to need at least, ideally, 200 cells, right, Colleen? And, RNA, the test, yeah. and the data is going to be back to those 200 cells. It's not going to be single cell data. It's going to be. Yeah. Okay. You're going to be asking questions like I tried to ask where you're saying, I want to know what's going on in that very focal microenvironment around my rare cell types. You're not going to be able to you know, specifically look at the transcriptome of that one cell. And, and again, you can't do that with single cell data either, by the way. So. Yeah, there's nothing currently on the market that's going to allow you to do that. Um, um, that being said, you know, there, there we are, I'm not sure if y'all saw the press release that came out earlier this week, but um, we are uh, working on uh, a new uh, profiler that will allow that um, coming up in the next uh, year or two. Chris Pinnell's got a good question, and Grant, I'm, you might be the best one mm -hmm. to answer to as far as additional filter sets and Grant, you might want to talk about some of the questions I posed to you about, you know, can we export images and, and use image J or other things? Since there's not image analysis software built into the nanostream platform, we've been trying to monkey around with ideas of how we can do some of that outside of the platform. Yeah, you certainly can do that. You can do that on the ROI selection end as well, where you export that scan into Fiji and map those segments back to do your segmentation. So. Yeah, there is that capability as well as exporting raw tips to do some sort of image analysis on, on your image as well and then correlate that with your transcriptome data. Yep. As far as the hardware options, is adding more filters? That I'll, I'll leave that question to Nanostream. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, we're not a flow cytometer. We're not trying to be a fluorescent imager. Um, really, we're enabling that technology or that bit of the technology to find your cells of interest and to allow you but, to enrich. For but, but, as, but as Mark said, Chris, we can, we can do maybe. Yep. Y'all are very lucky. You have many, <laughs> many options at your disposal. Yeah, there's a lot of cool toys now that we have here. Yeah. Well, with this, I think we answered all the questions that were, let me see, oops, another one. Okay, so actually, Colleen actually forced to put her email up there too. If you have any additional questions with regard to to preparing those samples, you know, in slides. Um, well, thank you everybody for participating on this. It's uh, it's been a great discussion. We hope to continue talking to you and hearing from you. Don't forget, we have the spatial uh, spatial omics uh, interest group coming up soon, so we will be able to share more information and learn more from each other. Uh, as always, uh, reach out to us, spatialomics at umn.edu, if you want to set up your, your first uh, uh, meeting or if you, want, if you have questions, and we'll go from there.
Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Andy, for doing this miracle turnaround work with you and your team. Yeah. I got, I, got to, I got to thank everybody that did all the work. I was a, but a, a small cog at the back of the ship holding the steering wheel. So I want to thank no, you, you guys. A lot of the folks on this call, others. So thank you. Incredibly impressive work. All right. Take care, Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye.